Welcome back to the Typhoon Legacy Channel, everybody. Thank you very much for your patience as I put these videos together. Uh, it has been a little while, and I find that I actually get quite a bit pickier with my editing uh, as the time wears on between videos. So this is my third attempt at this one. Hope it's the last. As you can see, just because it has been a little while with the video, it doesn't mean that progress has stopped in the shop here. I'm standing in a sea of Napier Saber parts. The engine has come apart very nicely, and uh, we've been quite stunned at the condition, amazing condition of the parts that we're seeing come out of this. Before I go too far into what I'm covering in this episode, uh, I would like to ask that if you're able to make a contribution to the project and help us, um, that you do so at uh, www.typhoonlegacy.com. The Hawker Typhoon and the Napier Sabre are both rare beasts. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into this and a lot of resources required to be able to put one of these back into the air, and we can use every little bit of help that we can get. Now, before I get into too much detail on uh, what you see surrounding me here in parts, I'd like to go over the basic uh, main assemblies of the Sabre with some... Uh, guiding pictures to help you guys identify what's going on. I'm hoping that that'll help uh, provide a better understanding of where a lot of these parts go. Um, so when you look at the overall assembly of a functioning Napier Sabre engine, you've got a lot of accessory drives and things mounted externally to the main mass of engine. And that, uh, we can start with the, the upper accessory case. And this is a, a drive case that uh, it drives the hydraulic pump, the distributors, the magnetos, air pump, compressor, things like that. And it's mounted to the top of the crankcase. Uh, that whole assembly can be removed, so we can take that off to the side. The same thing on the bottom, there's a lower accessory case, and this does the, uh, the fuel pump, coolant pumps, and oil pumps down there. Uh, that one also drops off the crankcase, and it can be removed. It's the next big assembly that can come off is the induction system. So you're looking at the supercharger with either the um, um, water meth metering and uh, uh, fuel injection units or a carburetor, depending on the mark of Sabre that you're looking at there. Um, then we can kind of look at the main body of the engine itself, and that uh, we can start to pull off things like the uh, uh, reduction gear housing in the prop shaft. You guys might remember that when we, uh, we removed it from this one. There's a bunch of pictures shared about that. That's basically the reduction gears, uh, lay shafts, a, a really ingenious uh, balance arm system for bal balancing loads between crankshafts. So once all that's removed, you're left with a very basic block. It's made up of four main components, and that's two cylinder blocks, one left, one right, and then two crankcase halves, one left and one right. And these all separate vertically and, uh, and allow you to get into the, the guts of this, uh, which is the two, two crankshafts and the rotating assemblies, connecting rods, pistons, and all that good stuff. So I'm going to switch cameras, and I'll take you over some of the uh, details of what's been happening in the shop over the last little while. Let's start from the outside in with the cylinder blocks. So this is the port cylinder block. You can see the starboard one is over there. We'll start over here. This is the rear side of it. You can see all of the sleeve mechanisms here. Two are out. These are the worm drives, and this is the front of the engine. So this entire assembly is driven from the reduction gear housing with this gear, which drives the lay shaft to drive the worm gears. Uh, timing is of the essence for this stuff, so if you if you're able to put this together and your timing wasn't right, you'd have to take the whole engine apart to come and correct your mistake. So it'll be very critical, critical when we get into this. You can see they were pretty thorough. I think I showed a bit of this from the inside of the crankcase on the last video, the cutaways that they did on the uh, worm gear housings. It's unfortunate, but those parts are actually not too bad to make from new. So it's, it's not an overly complex piece. Um, they can definitely be replaced. The good news is that all of the internal components are there and they're all nicely greased and in very good condition. In fact, we couldn't really see uh, much, if any, wear on the bronze drive gears on here, so we're really pleased with that. You can see, uh, unfortunately, the, the cylinders have been cut away on a couple of them, which everybody is aware of. Um, and in some cases, the sleeves have also been cut away. The sleeves are all slightly different colors and it's they're a bit mismatched. They're um, every one of these components was matched to the cylinder and when you get down to even these worm uh, drive uh, caps and housings and gears, everything was matched to its cylinder. They're all marked. Um, you can probably see them down there. I'm not too sure without my glasses right now, but the, the cylinder blocks themselves were marked with what this was. So this is say cylinder number one. Everything here, sleeves, uh, the crank, the, the gears, everything would be marked with number one. So, and number one starboard, so it wasn't messed up or mixed up with the uh, um, port side or vice versa. 
So quite interesting. These sleeves here, you can see they're, they're quite white. Um, and I believe what that is yet to be confirmed is that it was, these were uh, nitrided sleeves. And I think these were brand new sleeves off the shelf. Um, the nitriding on installation or before installation was supposed to be lapped. And I think these are unlapped nitrided sleeves. Unfortunately, they took new sleeves if that's the case and they cut them open, basically scrapping them. Um, I've also noticed that some of these sleeves are oversized. I know at least in one case, oversize for repair of these engines, the oversize was permitted and you could take a, a um, 10 thou increase in bore size and put a 10 thou oversized sleeve. So I've got to go through, we'll have to measure everything. Everything's inscribed with its oversize um, information on it. So we'll just have to go through and identify it very carefully to see what we're dealing with there. I'd like to take this out for you guys, but I don't really want to mess it up because the bearings the outer race on the bearings will just pop right out. So um, I can, I'll do this without tipping it. And you can see the drive for that bronze gear. Like everything, it's just so impressive to see how clean and such good condition this stuff is. Put that down, try not to lose any bearings. It's quite a heavy little assembly. Hard to do with a uh, camera in your hand too. So I'm going to leave it like that until I come back. You can see the... Uh, these are the uh, sleeve drive bushings. It's a split bushing and it allows for the rotation of the sleeve and oscillation of the sleeve. So pretty nice thing. If I move it just right, it'll all pop out of there, but I don't want to do that. They took great care when they assembled this. You can see there's a red grease or some sort of red grease that they've put in and they lubricated the bores before they put the sleeves into them. And we found the same thing. Everything, every time we take anything apart, it's thoroughly greased. Uh, the, the main bearings on the crank and everything have a preservative grease in them that just kept everything in really, really nice shape. So that's that block. Um, more dissection and a lot more research to do. So we'll do some more focused videos in the future on very specific items and how they work. Uh, just because of the uniqueness of this engine, I think, I hope you guys would really like that. So here's the other one. Again, we've got some sleeves. These ones are even whiter. I, again, I think it's the nitriding finish that has not been lapped. They've been installed with uh, plenty of grease, more cutaways here, not a huge issue. All the internals are there. All the internals are in excellent shape. So really happy to, uh, to see that and excited to get into uh, dealing with uh, measuring and non-destructive testing to see what can be used. So this is the port side crankcase half. I'm really impressed by it. I don't know why it has, the other side has the cranks, uh, crankshafts and the, some conrods and stuff in it, which also make it impressive. But this, it's just such a monstrous casting and so complex. Um, it's nice to see the bearings. I'm working on them right now because the Typhoon used several different kinds of main bearings. That's what these guys are, the crankshaft main bearings. Um, I've pulled a couple of these ones and it's, they all have the same number on them. So we've got to get the cranks off the other side and I think maybe the other side of these match set shells will have the proper part number and we can tell exactly what series of bearing they used in this, uh, this engine. So here you see the forward end of the starboard side of the crankshaft, or sorry, the crankcase, with both upper and lower crankshafts installed. Um, got a couple of bearings in there from the reduction gears still. This is the propeller shaft rear main bearing. And um, you can see we've still got a couple pistons in there. Now, what we've learned is the pistons don't actually fit through the bore. The, uh, the main bearing um, casting is a little bit too narrow to allow them in there, so they have to come out. But we're struggling a bit with the, the high tolerances and the, the time that these have been put together. So that we don't want to cause any damage, but they're, I wouldn't call them completely seized, but they're really tight. We haven't noticed any binding on anything that's come off. Uh, some of these have been very difficult as well um, for the connecting rods that have been removed, uh, say like this guy. So we don't know exactly what's causing it. Um, we're not too sure if they've assembled them correctly or not, but there is some binding in there. It's not causing any damage to the main journals. Um, so we're very happy with that, but we have to be very careful in removing those so we can get the connecting rod down and the uh, wrist pin for the, the piston out so that we can get this, this out of here. Um, not in too much of a rush. We have to build proper stands for the crankshafts so they don't uh, warp. They're very heavy, and if they're not supported correctly, you can destroy your cranks. Um, so a little bit of work to do there. All good stuff because we're going to have to do that um, to preserve the parts that we have here. Now another interesting thing here that I've just set aside because we've got a couple Napier Sabre sleeves out. Uh, there's a piston. The Sabre has a five inch bore just for reference. 
This is a Bristol Hercules sleeve, so you can see how much bigger that is than the Sabre. And then next over to it is the Granddaddy of them all, and this is the Bristol Centaurus. So the Centaurus sleeve here is provided to, on loan to us by the KF Center for Excellence, and it's an excellent example, along with the Hercules sleeve provided to, uh, on loan from the Bomber Command Museum of Canada. Uh, an excellent comparison, I should say, for the different primary sleeves of that era. Now the Centaurus, I'm not a Centaurus or a Hercules expert, so I won't go too far into it, but the Centaurus was a 53 liter engine. I believe the ultimate variation, perhaps not even put into production, was 3000 horsepower at 53 liters. The Hercules is a uh, 38.6 liter engine, I believe. Um, the 0.6 is my only question here. It's a 38 liter engine. And the Sabre was a 36.6 liter engine. So quite a, a massive difference in displacement, but the most powerful one, uh, ultimate variant, was the Sabre at uh, a rated, uh, an approved and rated 3,500 horsepower. So pretty impressive, uh, smaller displacement, much smaller package and uh, high output engine. Just another quick look from this side here. Whoops. One thing that I thought was really interesting uh, in removal of the pistons, I'll take our gear out here. We've got the, uh, the piston with the wrist pin in it here uh, and it's attaching hardware. Uh, one thing that I found really impressive about these was the weight of them. When we took them out, I was surprised at how much mass there is to this. And uh, I weighed them and they are 3.4 pounds each, which times 24 equals over 81 pounds of pistons flying around in this engine, which is just massive. I'd, I'm not sure why they had to make them so heavy. They, they likely had a reason, but uh, a modern engine wouldn't have that kind of weight on it for sure. I have to talk with a guy like Callum Douglas from the Secret Horsepower Race. He would be uh, a fellow to ask that kind of question. Remember, if you can, please subscribe to our paid channel. We really need your help. It's only a couple of bucks a month, and uh, you can be one of those who can proudly claim that you helped Hawker Typhoon JP843 return to flight. Take care, guys.